Hello, my name is Thomas. Welcome to British Culture. Albion never dies. This week, U is for United Kingdom. And why not? Lots of people did suggest Union Jack, but the Union Jack is really a creation of the Act of the Union, and I thought before I explain the Act of the Union, I should explain something about the kingdoms which made it. This is really a Back to Basics episode, because as I travel around the world, I come across people who've heard of England and the UK and Scotland and, and Ireland, and but they generally don't know how it all clunks together. Which bit is which on this septed isle? This septed isle is, of course, the beginning of that wonderful speech by John of Gaunt in Shakespeare's Richard II. There are many, many divisions within these islands, and, uh, well, it causes a huge amount of confusion to people outside the British Isles, which makes sense, um, but it also causes confusion to people who live within it. Being from a place doesn't necessarily make you an expert on it, in the same way that, you know, the language that you're born and brought up speaking isn't always the language you're best able to explain, because the rules are just the rules, you said, because you said, and equally, if you live in a place, well, it's just, it's just normal, it's just the way it is. Uh, I think it can be interesting when you look at other languages and how they describe where I'm living right now, so we say Great Britain, and Doctor Who has the joke that there's no Great Germany, there's no Great France, only Britain is great, but it's worth checking in other languages, do they call us great? Well, in France, uh, you know, we live on Grande Britannique, uh, in Turkish, Britannia, Although you don't hear that too often, it's normally just Inglaterra, uh, although much more commonly just here, Londra. So even though I don't live very close to London, I live hundreds of miles away and actually have very rarely been there. I think I've been there more in the last year than all of the rest of my life put together, just visiting friends, um, as you may have seen on my social media, but I just pop in there, take a million photos and then post them like over the next few months. Um, but no, I have very little to do with London, and yet Turks would always ask me, what's it like living in London? <laughs> Don't know. I guess it's like if you're from California, what's it like living in New York? Uh, but anyway, these are the terms for other people who aren't desperately invested uh, for these islands. In Chinese, of course, you can say Great Britain, Da Bu Li Jian. But much, much, much more often you'll hear Ying Guo. Uh, Brave land. Of course they call us brave land. Very fitting. <laughs> Although they probably call us that because it just sounds similar. America is big war. Uh, beautiful land. But again, it's what fits. In the Facebook group, Britain People, Places and Pastimes, uh, where I often share these episodes and ask for input, uh, I've often hear, seen people uh, write, you know, Great Britain used to be great, but it's not anymore, which I think misunderstands why we're calling it great. Of course, I am in Great Britain because I'm on the biggest island of around 7,000 islands which make up the British Isles. Around 7,000, of course it depends on your exact definition of an island. This definition doesn't include things that are generally hidden by tides once or twice a day, um, but they're bigger than rocks. Um, <laughs> they're things you can legitimately land upon and walk about on. So around 7,000, again, estimates do vary. Not all of them are inhabited, of course, uh, but I'm having a little look at the islands and the constituent bits. Of course, the biggest island is the one on which you have England, Scotland and Wales, although each of them possess their own islands. Then, of course, you have Northern Ireland on the island of Ireland, which also has many, many islands. And, uh, and I will touch upon the Scottish islands like the Inner and Outer Hebrides, the Shetland Islands and the Orkneys, down south the Channel Islands and, I'd say, in the Irish Sea, the great big one the Isle of Man. So we have a whole collection of islands that all make up the British Isles. Um, and, I, and I'll include the island of Ireland there. It has become, uh, well, I'd say political because people confuse the British Isles with the United Kingdom, but of course the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland are those that are part of the Union, the Act of the Union, and remain part of the Act of the Union. Um, so it is the, the nation state or state of several nations uniting together. Oh gosh, this does get complicated. Maybe I should just go through it bit by bit. I'll start with the obvious, the senior England. England, on the big island, <laughs> Great Britain, uh, was formed by Alfred the Great, who was the King of Wessex, became king in 871. Now, Wessex is largely uh, the Midlands of England, roughly, but he was able to unite 
the different Anglo-Saxon tribes, the people who spoke English. He united them in order to fight the Vikings. This had been done before, several times. Kings would often unite the kingdoms around them, get rid of that external threat, and they'd just go back to life as it had been before the threat. Uh, Alfred the Great was great because he was truly able to unite them, order them, organise them, and create institutions that would live long after he had passed away. He passed away in 899 AD, but the institutions that he created carried on, including the institution that is England and the Royal Navy. Although this is much debated by academics, but I think traditionally we've seen him as the man who founded the Royal Navy. Previous kings who united other kings did have uh, navies which they put together, and again they disbanded uh, very rapidly the Royal Navy was a standing navy that he was able to create. Again, any uh, medievalists are welcome to get in touch with me and we can talk about this. Um, but he united what is largely the Midlands and the south of England. The north, of course, was under Dane law. It was ruled by the Vikings. And it's really interesting whenever you hear these debates about the north-south divide in England, what was under the Danes is largely considered the North, and what was governed by Alfred the Great is largely what we consider the South. One of the interesting results of this is that there are cities geographically further north than a neighbour that we might commonly think of as North, and yet that northern neighbour is actually considered Southern by many, and often it just does match on to, uh, well, the Dane law. Anyway, that's really the formation of England, unifying all these... Uh, these kind of Germanic settlers uh, who displaced the Romanized Britons, uniting them against that threat of the Vikings. So we end up with this kind of interesting little state, still going today, called England. Of course, we don't really have the Danes anymore because the English were able to, to slowly erase them, <laughs> slowly able to push them out, or rather erase their rule, and uh, fold it into England. So then we ended up with a border between uh, England and Scotland, and Scotland's an interesting one. It's very, very famous throughout the world. Everywhere I've been, even in very remote parts of China, people have heard of Scotland. It has immense cultural clout for a place that is small and very, very, very sparsely populated in places. It just seems a fashionable place, and it comes in and out of fashion, whether in the kind of the, <laughs> the Victorians had their biscuit tin view of Scotland and their, their craze for kilts and clan tartans, which were kind of a Victorian creation. I mean, obviously, people from a place would naturally make clothes in a traditional way, but the idea of this kind of formalised genealogy of tartan, very, very much a, a 19th century thing. Uh, more recently, I guess in the 90s, you had this craze for Scottish filmmaking, uh, train spotting, if you're interested in that, which made uh, Ewan McGregor a bit of a star. Mrs. Brown, uh, with Judy Dench and Billy Connolly, and even 1999's The World Is Not Enough, the Bond film, which kind of copied um, Mrs. Brown and a few other films um, with their kind of their warm honey filters, and Monica of the Glen, which came later, 2000, 2005. It was a TV show which had a, a very kind of warm glow every time we looked at Scotland, a very honeyed filter. Of course, much of Harry Potter, the outdoor scenes, uh, gets filmed in Scotland, but the landscape grows kind of darker and darker as the films progress, in line, of course, with the stories as the main characters mature, um, but it also kind of, I feel, reaches an apogee uh, with the James Bond film Skyfall 2012, where you see this bleak uh, landscape, this glens formed by glaciers in the Ice Age. Um, I do love that line when Bond says, uh, we're going somewhere where they don't have the advantage, we're going back in time. <laughs> and it's Scotland, I'm not sure how the series got away with that. Maybe because it's trumped by the later line, Welcome to Scotland, which in context, it's a pretty cool line. Anyway, it's a very cinematic place. I've been able, not even Googling anything, just looking, just thinking, I've been uh, able to come up with a fair few Scottish films. Um, there is a question. Does Hollywood know that Wales exists? I can't think of, uh, of a Welsh film apart from the British film Zulu. Um, and yet it's, uh, well, 
is full of culture and of course has its own language, Welsh, the oldest unchanged language in Europe. And of course what they have given us are wonderful, wonderful singers such as uh, Dame Shirley Bassey and Tom Jones. Uh, so they have made quite their contribution to our cultural landscape. And of course Wales is famous for its mines, its singing, its unusual language, <laughs> its... Uh, it's fair to say it was some inspiration for J.R. Tolkien when he was creating his race of dwarfs uh, in The Lord of the Rings. And so their culture maybe gets fitted into uh, cinematic history a bit. Although I think in the movie Gimli has more of a Scottish accent than a, a lilting Welsh accent. Of course Wales may be famous around the world, more of a thing that, uh, that someone is prince of or princess of. Uh, that is, of course, because Edward I promised all the Welsh princes that he'd choose a prince for them who spoke not a word of English and gave them his infant son, uh, later known as the Black Prince, to be their ruler. And it became the tradition that the uh, the heir apparent to the English throne is the Prince of Wales. It's where they, it's where they cut their teeth, of course, Henry V. One of the more famous medieval kings uh, rarely did cut his teeth in immense interesting battles in uh, Wales and of course got a scar on his face in reality uh, which you very rarely see depicted in fiction. Anyway, anyway, I shall move on from that, Wales being a very very beautiful place uh, but I have to fit in all the kingdoms and uh, well, it makes sense to touch on Ireland, Northern Ireland. I haven't touched on it as much in this podcast as I would like. I have had people asking me uh, about Ireland and Northern Ireland, so well, why not include it here? Ireland is, of course, the second biggest island in the British Isles, so Great Britain is the big one. We have England, Scotland and Wales. Ireland is the big one next to it. Um, where, of course, you have the patron saint, St. Patrick, a Romanised Briton who was captured and sold into slavery by Irish raiders and who was ultimately able to escape and went back there in order to convert them to, well, better ways, Christian ways. Ireland and what we consider now England, because, of course, at the time of St. Patrick there was no England. <laughs> Alfred hadn't invented it yet. Um, but this Great Britain and Ireland have had a long, long history. Um, Anglo-Saxon princes, of course, after the Norman conquest, fled to Ireland to escape their persecution, and the Normans followed hot on their heels. The Normans conquered England in 1066 and naturally spread. But many of the uh, the Norman knights frankly dissatisfied with what they got. They felt they deserved more. They put their lives on the line and felt that this little place, England, really wasn't enough for them, especially when uh, the best lands were given to the king and his brothers. So some of them marched into Wales, they have the Welsh marches, and in Ireland they settled a place which became known as the Pale. Of course, the Palisade is the, the original name. It gets shortened to the Pale, uh, which becomes known as Dublin um, <laughs> in the local language, of course. Um, and Pale has entered the English language. I think in uh, Apocalypse Now, you have the great use of it uh, when they're describing, the US Army is describing Marlon Brando's rogue colonel, Colonel Kurtz. They say, he's out there totally beyond the pale of any acceptable human conduct, beyond the pale. It's a, it's a literal thing. Uh, it is the fence around old Dublin. And those who live beyond it, well, barbarians. And those who lived within it, hopefully were civilised, although in time sheep grew like their shepherd and shepherd like their sheep and became quite the worry to the Normans. Um, and, of course, in the English Civil War, you have the role of the Irish who were coming into England as mercenaries and so you have the Battle of Bristol as an intense fight because Bristol could be used as a port by the king it faces the port faces Ireland so it could have been used to bring in Irish mercenaries so therefore the, uh, the parliamentary forces no taxation without representation they were battling to keep uh, Bristol uh, I mentioned in the O is for Oliver Cromwell episode uh, his most famous barbarous act in Ireland, the massacre at Drogheda in uh, 1649, the forces he slaughtered were both English and Irish, uh, again, being a continuation of the Civil War. It's hard not to talk about this without talking about the battles, because that's so often what's recorded, they're the, the sparks in history where, where heads are butted. But of course, cooperation is the majority of the history in interesting ways. And much of the 19th century British politics was dominated 
by the topic Home Rule for Ireland, Gladstone's 1886 bill split the parties at Westminster in much the same way that Brexit uh, split political parties today and perhaps to an even greater extent. People often complain politics is so divided today. I must say I would much rather live with Brexit than live with, well, Gladstone's party-splitting bill or indeed with the Civil War of the 17th century. Um, but I find that really interesting. That has been a, a real thread throughout English history and indeed because it ties into Welsh nationalism, Scotch nationalism and if I talk about, you know, say the Oxford history of, of England, actually encompasses Ireland and Wales and Scotland because these terms have fluctuated throughout history. We've also used it in the same way that Alfred the Great does, which is people who speak English are English. Indeed, the, uh, the American colonialists described themselves as English and referred to you know, our brethren in England. So it has been a very wide term as well as becoming increasingly narrowly defined. Anyway, I say it's hard to talk about Ireland without talking about that and Northern Ireland and the Protestant and Catholic communities who haven't always gotten along. And yet, the contribution to art and culture, it, it packs an even bigger punch. Uh, of course, movie stars like Liam Neeson, uh, who has recently been talking about how he did not become James Bond uh, because the lady in his life told him not to, oh, kissing all those other girls. <laughs> and of course, Kenneth Branagh, um, who Rowan Atkinson has said, that man's done more for Shakespeare than Shakespeare ever did. <laughs> and, uh, of course, lately has gotten into directing films like Thor. Um, he did this comic book movie. I was quite surprised at why he did it, but it seemed to be a fantastic career movie that demonstrated how well he could handle really massive budgets. Oh, I'm very glad always to see him in a Christopher Nolan film, and I've always thought, oh, if only Christopher Nolan did a Bond film, then Kenneth Branagh would be the perfect M, if not Ralph Fiennes, Ray Fiennes. Of course, in sporting history, Northern Ireland will always have had the greatest uh, football player in British history, which is George Best, literally in the man's name, and he is eminently quotable. George Best, who once said, I spent a lot of money on booze, birds, and fast cars. The rest, I just squandered. <laughs> <laughs> and also said, I used to go missing a lot. Miss Canada, Miss United Kingdom, Miss World. <laughs> he also uh, famously said, I've stopped drinking, but only while I'm asleep. And uh, rebutted some of his critics by saying, people always say I shouldn't be burning the candle at both ends. Maybe they haven't got a big enough candle. And, uh, oh, finally, I just can't resist one more quote from George Best. I might go to Alcoholics Anonymous, but I think it would be difficult for me to remain anonymous. Great football player uh, from the 60s. And, of course, we can go back uh, further. C.S. Lewis, a Protestant from Northern Ireland, whose arguments with a Catholic English J.R. Tolkien uh, became legendary. There are many books worth reading about that. I think Mere Christianity would be my favourite, but there are a fair few others. So... So, those are the big ones. England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, of course, including Ireland. What else is there to talk about? Well, we have the Scottish Islands, and there are hundreds and hundreds of them. Just putting them into collections, we have the Inner and Outer Hebrides, the Inner Hebrides and the Outer Hebrides being many collections of Hebrides Islands, and uh, I've been in and around them um, when I was navigating a little Royal Navy coastal patrol ship uh, because it is a very, very, very good place to learn navigation because it's very tricky conditions, but it is also one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. The weather is striking. Uh, I've heard some Scots say dreich and some Scots say dreich, um, and what that means is when you get multiple weather patterns at once. Uh, so I remember standing on a, the flying deck of a ship, and you're exposed to the elements, and I had rain, I had hail, I had sunshine, I had warm and cold air. I had everything all at once. It felt as if I was on a movie set with people throwing buckets of different weather at me, and it's simply because these are the islands that face into the the North Atlantic, and they break up weather patterns in weird and interesting ways. And, of course, there are settled populations on them and of humans and golden eagles, and they are very, very, very beautiful to see as they skim along the surface. Um, I couldn't resist doing a bit of research, of course, rather than just going off my own happy memories. I looked at the, uh, the Hebrides tourism website, uh, one of them, the Isle of Barra, 
uh, which is a bit too wee and rocky for a standard airport, says a tourist uh, ministry. But then again, who wants standard? Port Adair Barra is a Hebridean transport hub and the only one in the world where scheduled flights use a tidal beach for a runway. That's why landing and taking off here is such an iconic, beautiful and surreal experience. Barra to a T. I would say, yes, iconic, beautiful and surreal very much describes the Scottish islands. I've also been to the Orkney Islands. Um, I stepped ashore. I was one of the few people on the ships to do so, uh, so that I could plug in electricity and, and water and so on. I didn't spend a huge amount of time wandering around, although I would love to, because it contains some of the oldest and best preserved Neolithic sites in Europe, the heart of Neolithic. Orkney is a designated UNESCO World Heritage Site. Definitely a place for me to uh, pop back to at some point. And then, and then the Shetland Islands. It's popularly said that the nearest train station is in Norway. I think Billy Connolly said isn't the nearest tree in Norway as well and got some kind of interesting response from his uh, Shetland Island audience. It's far away on maps of the UK. It's normally in a little box similar to how Hawaii and Alaska are shown on US maps. And the Shetland Islands, there's more than a hundred of them, although only 15 are permanently inhabited uh, by a total of about 23,000 people, one of whom, I believe, listens to this podcast from Shetland with Love. Hello. <laughs> Most of them live on uh, the biggest island, which, brilliantly to my mind, is known as Mainland. <laughs> so, yes, I, uh, I had a quick Google, actually, before this episode of, you know, British Isles, and I was curious to see Great Britain listed on one bit and mainland listed on another bit. I thought, oh, that's funny, Google's put them twice, it hasn't really realised they're the same place. And then I clicked on them and my goodness, <laughs> no, mainland in the UK is a lot smaller um, <laughs> than Great Britain. Anyway, anyway, it's also... Shetlands are, of course, home uh, to the Shetland Pony, uh, who measure between 28 and 42 inches, or 107 centimetres high. Small, but very, very strong. And something that's worth Googling is Up Heli Ah, which is a uh, fire festival held annually in Shetland on the last Tuesday in January, Up Heli Ah. Uh, so visitors are welcome as they use, I think, a thousand torches to set fire to a great wooden ship. Um, but it's very much a local event, so participants must have been a resident in Shetland for five years before they can take part in a squad and the procession. However, visitors are warmly welcomed in one of the halls for festivities after the procession, provided they can get their hands on much sought-after ticket. I must admit, this isn't a festival that I knew a huge amount about. Uh, I've just been looking it up for this podcast. Um, the organisation of the Up Heli Ah is voluntary, run by a committee of 17 members, uh, with a new member elected every year and to become Geyser Jarl, the chief geyser, the chief committee member. Uh, a member must serve 16 years on the committee. Wow. Uh, the pictures of it are spectacular, so uh, even if you uh, don't have this as your recommended rabbit hole, I do suggest Google Image as your as your <laughs> I'm not sure if that's even a rabbit hole that's just a rabbit's blade of grass <laughs> anyway down south we've got some other islands so I'll go through the English ones now, the Channel Islands so when William the Conqueror came over he was of course living in northern France and that's that's uh, where Normandy is. Uh, of course, over time, uh, the Normans would lose their French lands. Um, hang on, it wasn't the Normans. The, the Plantagenets would lose bits and so on, so on, so on. Successive bits of the family would lose different bits. But anyway, anyway, the Channel Islands are the bits that remain. They are very, very, very close to France uh, rather than England and therefore become the only bit of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, etc., 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 to be occupied by the Germans during World War II, which by an odd result means that they are the only British people who were asked to drive on the right-hand side of the road. Barbaric. Anyway, the Channel Islands consist of the, the Bailwick of Jersey, which is the largest of the islands with a population just over 100,000 people. Um, and it's also one of the world's largest offshore financial centres. Uh, keeps it keeps it in good stead. Um, and they have their own currency, still using the £1 note then you have Guernsey, consisting of, uh, well, Guernsey, 
uh, Old Sark and Herm. I don't think I've ever met anyone from any of those. Uh, the populations are too small. Uh, a friend of mine recently met someone from Stark, um, so he was uh, he was pretty surprised. It's a, a very small island, I think a few hundred families. And then, of course, you've got the Isle of Wight. Uh, the Isle of Wight, famously, if you want to know what the Isle of Wight looked like 50 years ago, just go today. <laughs> Life there is very much as it always was. Ah, I couldn't resist telling that joke to a, a fellow I knew from the Isle of Wight. I didn't know him very well, I just couldn't resist. And he was like, ah, so you have been. <laughs> yes. Like all these little islands, they are beautiful. And uh, there's one that I haven't been to but would like to go to, which is the Isle of Man, a self-governing crown dependency in the Irish Sea between Great Britain and Ireland. So the, the head of state is, of course, Charles III, so he's the Lord of Man. It's represented by Lieutenant Governor. Uh, the United Kingdom is responsible for the island's military defences and represents it abroad and so on, but it has its own parliament older than the Parliament at Westminster, the Tinwald. The Tinwald on the Isle of Man is claimed to have been in continuous existence since the year 979 or earlier. It should make it the oldest continuously sitting governing body in the world. There have been no breaks, which is what sets it apart uh, from all the others that claim to be old or as old, a couple of claim to be older, but it's the only one that's been continuously sitting and governing the voting age on the island is 16, uh, so they get to vote a little bit before the rest of us, that little population of 84,000 people. They used to have some really good film uh, tax breaks, so there was a sudden spike in TV shows uh, filming there. And, like uh, the Channel Islands, they've got their own currency, the Manx Pound, which looks quite different from those used in Great Britain. Although, I should say, uh, yes... The English have our own currency, there's Scottish money, uh, Northern Ireland has its own notes, I think Wales is the one that doesn't. So, a Back to Basics episode as I describe, and just a few, a few of the 7,000 islands that make up the British Isles and the United Kingdom are those that, you know, are under King Charles III, and uh, I hope... I hope that helps clarify things for those who live abroad. And if you're living here, I hope you just enjoyed my telling of it. Um, and let me know if there's something you thought wasn't right, because some of this does get debated. <sighs> I, shall, uh, I shall end, as I started, with that wonderful speech uh, from Shakespeare. This royal throne of kings, this septed isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself, against infection and the hand of war. This happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall, or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. My name is Thomas. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of British Culture. Albion never dies. <laughs>